Okay, so um, let's review the ellipse. First, you got to know the geometric definition of the ellipse. So we start with a pair of points in the plane. We'll call them the foci. Each focus, just to make life simple, we're going to put the foci along the x-axis equally spread from the origin, but the foci could be anywhere in the plane. It's just that the equation you might get uh, is going to look probably pretty nasty. So we'll just keep our foci centered at the origin in this case, and we'll have them um, along the x-axis. Fix a length that's larger than the distance between the two foci. And once you fix that length and you have the two foci located, then you're going to look for the collection of points for which the distance to the two foci add up to that fixed constant. And this collection of points is what we call an ellipse. And you're going to get a shape that looks pretty much like a distorted circle. Now let's give uh, coordinates to the foci. So by the way we've placed them, they'll have coordinates C0 and negative C0. We're going to look at a special case. On the far right, we'll have a point, let's call it A comma 0. And um, those two blue segments add up to length K. Well, the longer segment has to be length A plus C. And the shorter segment has to be A minus C. So when you add those two lengths up, you realize that you must have 2a. So it turns out this distance, this common length, the, the sum of which the distances to the two foci always add up to, that length is 2a. So we can replace the k with a 2a now. By the way, there's a point on the other side, negative a comma 0, by symmetry. Uh, these two points at the, at the left and right we call the vertices of the ellipse. So we can replace the k with a 2a. That's what we've been looking at all along, as it turns out. There's one other special case, which is when you look at 0 comma b, uh, you've got a pair of congruent triangles there. So the sum of the two blue segments, the, the sum of the links has to be 2a. So each of those has the same length and therefore has to be half that total, or just a. Now, you have a right triangle with legs b and c, respectively. And so the Pythagorean form, formula tells you that a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. Now, um, by symmetry, there's a point on the bottom. We'll call that 0, negative b. So we're going to need that relationship later when we derive the equation of the ellipse. So here's our ellipse with the two foci. A generic point, which is to say it doesn't have to be a special point, any point. A generic point has this property that the distance to one focus plus the distance to the other focus is equal to 2a. That's what we just discovered. So what we're going to do is apply some algebra. Well, we've done that elsewhere, so I'm going to just cut to the chase. The resulting equation is that beautiful looking thing, which is a lot nicer than the one on the top. So what are the key features of the ellipse? So let's remind ourselves. Here's a picture of the ellipse. There's the simplified equation. We call that distance the focal distance. We call that distance the semi-minor axis. We call that distance the semi-major axis. And the relationship that we want to keep in mind is that one. But that one doesn't mean much to me. Um, B might be bigger than A, in which case your foci line up along the y-axis instead of the x-axis, and your idea of A squared equals B squared plus C squared goes right out the window. So perhaps the more important way to think about this is that the semi-major axis squared is equal to the semi-minor axis squared plus the focal distance squared. Then you can't go wrong. As long as you've identified these three quantities, you just plug them into this relationship. Um, I actually prefer a different version of this where I get the focal distance on one side and then I have a difference of semi-major, semi-minor axis squared on the other. Um, I just prefer that one. So let's talk about measures of distortion. We've seen that a, an ellipse is basically a circle. It's sort of distorted. So how could we measure distortion? I think the most natural measure of distortion 
is to take the ratio of the semi-major axis to the semi-minor axis. We'll call that the dilatation, and I might call that D, or denote it D. D is equal to A over B in this case. Um, let's take a look at, uh, at some ellipses and their dilatations. Now by definition, since you're taking the longer of the two semi-axes, uh, D is always destined to be greater than or equal to 1. So we'll just take a look at some ellipses and their corresponding dilatations, and you can see that the dilatation really gives you a mental picture. Uh, it's telling you the ratio of, uh, in this case, width to height. And uh, it's very easy to take a dilatation, sort of translate it into a picture in your mind of how distorted the ellipse is. Uh, D equals 1 corresponds to a circle, and as D increases, you get greater distortion. Now, you won't see dilatation used a lot. Um, a more common uh, measure of distortion is called the eccentricity. And you define the eccentricity by taking the focal distance and dividing by the semi-major axis. We'll denote this quantity E. E is C over A in this case. And you'll notice now that E is destined to be strictly less than 1 and greater than or equal to 0 because you're taking a distance, the focal distance that's destined, it's got to be smaller than the semi-major axis. So this quotient has to be between 0 and 1. And... Um, so we're going to look at those same ellipses. This time, we will measure the eccentricity. Um, one of the things you should notice is that, um, first of all, E equals 0 corresponds to the circle. And then as E approaches 1, you get greater distortion. So what's the relationship between distort the dilatation and the eccentricity. Start with this fundamental relationship and you can easily recover the relationship between eccentricity and dilatation. We'll just divide through by the semi-major axis squared. And you'll notice that on the left hand side you have the definition of E squared. The middle term on the right of the equal sign, that's one, and then the far right term is the reciprocal of the square of dilatation. So that's your relationship between eccentricity and dilatation. And you can use that to go back and forth. And so let's just notice that when E is close to 0, that's to say D is close to 1. And these cases are both close to being circular. And when E is close to 1, D is very large. And this is the case of uh, high distortion. So let's look at one example. Halley's Comet orbits the sun uh, every 76 point something or other years. And the eccentricity of this orbit is 0.967. If you feed that into the relationship we just saw, the dilatation is, uh, is about 3.9, as we'll see in a second. Uh, one of the things you should know about this orbit is the semi-major axis is about 17.8 astronomical units. And an astronomical unit is exactly the average uh, Earth orbit radius. Uh, so it's about almost 18 Earth orbit radii um, wide, this Halley Comet orbit. And the dilatation is about 3.925, which means you could cut that distance, 17.8, uh, down by about f a factor of 4, and that'll give you the semi-minor axis. So Halley's Comet's fairly well distorted, and um, and so there you go. Last sighting was in 1986, so set your calendars for the next one.